Okay, well, greetings and welcome to this morning's webinar, Borders and Walls in the New Jerusalem and American History. I'm Kelly Morrissey, Managing Director of the Center for Continuing Education at Yale Divinity School. If you haven't done so already, I encourage you to check out our various programs, events, and offerings on our website, and we'll drop that address in the chat a bit later. I also want to introduce Megan Lukens, our Communications Coordinator, who's with us this morning. If you're having any technical difficulties or questions, please feel free to reach out to Megan directly. And before I introduce our lecturer for today, just a couple of quick notes. Uh, background noise can be distracting for others and we are recording this session. So please remain muted during our time together. We'll have a time of questions a bit later. So if any questions come up for you over the course of the lecture, just drop them in the chat. You can send them directly to me or in the general chat. I'll keep track of them and then uh, we'll give them to Dr. Lin. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Yijan Lin, Associate Professor of New Testament at Yale Divinity School. Professor Lin specializes in textual criticism, the revelation of John, critical race theory, gender and sexuality, and immigration. Her book, The Erotic Life of Manuscripts, examines how metaphors of race, family, evolution, and genetic inheritance have shaped the goals and assumptions of New Testament textual criticism from the 18th century through the present. Her current book project, Immigration and Apocalypse, the Revelation of John in the History of American Immigration, focuses on apocalyptism and the use of revelation in the political discourse surrounding American immigration, both in utopian visions of America and dystopian fear of outsiders. Professor Lin has also published a number of scholarly works in edited volumes, such as Present and Future of Biblical Studies, the Oxford Handbook of New Testament, Gender and Sexuality, and Reading in These Times, The Critical Task. Dr. Lin is also the co-creator of the Yale Bible Study on Women in the Bible, and we encourage you to check that out as well. Dr. Lin, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you all for joining me today. I'm going to go ahead by sharing my screen. So the talk is uh, titled Borders and Walls in the New Jerusalem and American History. And I will begin it with a quote from Frederick Turner, a uh, historian in the late uh, 19th, uh, sorry, in the late 19th century. Since the days when the fleet of Columbus sailed into the waters of the new world, said Frederick Turner, America has been another name for opportunity and the people of the United States have taken their tone from incessant expansion. According to Turner, addressing the American Historical Association in 1893, the dominant characteristic of American history and national identity had been movement and expansion, ever pushing the frontier away from the East Coast, away from the old world. Had been, but it could be so no longer. And now, Turner concludes, four centuries from the discovery of America at the end of a hundred years of life under the constitution, the frontier has gone and with its closing has closed the first period of American history. This did not mean the end of frontier mentality and spirit, however, only that Americans no longer had, quote, gifts of free land and limitless West towards which to reach and on which to struggle and build and fight in cathartic transformation. In his book, The End of the Myth, From the Frontier to the Border Wall in the Mind of America, historian Greg Grandin points to other more abstract frontiers that have served America's need for expansion, that also directed national conflicts outward and served as a release valve for violence. These abstract frontiers have appeared as social frontiers for internal progress or a push for individual freedom against government restraint, and most of all, the frontier of war. American military occupation and war from Mexico to the Caribbean to Central America, in the Philippines, through the world wars, in Korea, then Vietnam, from the Cold War to the war against terror, have fed the incessant American need to extend a frontier, whether at home or abroad, literal or figurative. But the myth of the frontier, the most powerful and most invoked of American myths, Brandon argues, comes to an end with Donald Trump, 
signaled most clearly when Trump announced during his 2015 presidential campaign, I will build a great wall. There have always been demarcations and some scattered structures delimiting US territory, of course. But Grandin argues that Trump's declaration of a great continuous barrier wall um, may, marks the end of the boundless frontier and the beginning of a new symbol of America, a pronouncement against endless bounty in a limit manifested and hardened into a solid wall. The wall, in Grandin's words, stands for a nation that still thinks freedom means freedom from restraint, but no longer pretends in a world of limits that everyone can be free and enforces that reality through cruelty, domination, and racism. In Grandin's interpretation, this new symbol represents a startling shift in political rhetoric and imagination, but one long in the making. Now, instead of the limitless beyond, the vision of the wall refashions the country into a besieged medieval fortress complete with its own revered martyr's cult. We are leaving the myth of the frontier for the new myth of the wall. But I argue that there is another myth that we must take into account, one also present at the sailing of Columbus and foundational to the identity of America, one that has not ended with the loss of the frontier, but continues to the present, spanning the eras of Columbus, colonies, frontiers, and now the wall. It is the myth of America as the new Jerusalem, part of God's new heaven and new earth from the book of Revelation. Like the frontier myth, the myth of the new Jerusalem promoted American exceptionalism and powered westward expansion. But unlike the frontier myth, which died and hardened into the myth of the wall, the myth of the holy city promises both infinite possibility in the eternity of heaven and guarded walls protecting God's people from the outer darkness. Apocalypses and Revelation in particular present marvelously protean narratives and images able to be used and reused without a sign of wear and tear, evidenced by the dozens of expired end time predictions in millenary and cults of the last 2000 years. Revelation stretches with amazing elasticity to encompass an apocalyptic discovery myth for Columbus searching for paradise, the promise of a new Jerusalem for the Puritans establishing a new church order, providing the divine fiat to continue that heaven and earth through manifest destiny, and giving language and imagery to the argument of white nativists for a pure, clean, white, heavenly population. Revelation's myth has empowered all of these, and now its visions have been used to fuel the clamor for a wall and failing a literal wall, all the barriers possible to exclude the unwanted at America's borders. There is no doubt that the language surrounding Trump's wall is the language of the Bible and of Revelation in particular. On the day of his inauguration, January 20, 2017, Trump sat in St. John's Episcopal Church across from the street of the White House for a religious service before the inaugural ceremony. Reverend Robert Jeffress, a Southern Baptist pastor and Trump campaigner delivered the sermon, the main theme of which likened Trump to a hero of the Bible, Nehemiah. This is what Jeffress preached. When I think of you, President Elam Trump, I am reminded of another great leader God chose thousands of years ago in Israel. The nation had been in bondage for decades. The infrastructure of the country was in shambles, and God raised up a powerful leader to restore the nation. And the man God chose was neither a politician nor a priest. Instead, God chose a builder whose name was Nehemiah. And the first step of rebuilding the nation was the building of a great wall. God instructed Nehemiah to build a wall around Jerusalem to protect its citizens from enemy attack. You see, God is not against building walls. To Jeffress and to thousands of Trump supporters, Nehemiah perfectly prefigures the role they believed and still believe Trump would play. Chosen by God, yet not confined by the restraints of, a, of an official religious role, not a politician, never mind that Nehemiah was assuredly a politician as the royal cupbearer and then governor of Judea, but a builder, qua developer, Trump appeared to his loyalists as divinely destined to rebuild America, to make it great again, just as Nehemiah did in repairing and rebuilding Jerusalem's walls. 
Jeffers' words implicitly condemn the Obama administration and those before it for holding the nation in bondage and letting it decay into ruin. Trump would rebuild, not just figuratively, but literally rebuild and newly build an impenetrable wall as he promised throughout his campaign. As he said in May of 2015, I would build a wall like nobody can build a wall. And again, in August, 2015, I'm a great builder. What do I do best in life? I build. Your infrastructure is crumbling. Isn't it nice to have a builder, a real builder? Nehemiah repaired and built the walls of the old Jerusalem, the holy city of David, the location of the temple, and the site of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Jeffress, in his sermon, names Trump the builder of the wall of America, and not just America, but America as the analog of the old Jerusalem. That is, America as the new Jerusalem, the new seat of God. God's country and the shining city on a hill. This meaning is made even clearer in an interview Jeffress gave two years later on Fox and Friends justifying the wall. He says, you know, I had the privilege of preaching the sermon before President Trump's inauguration, and I chose the Old Testament story of God telling Nehemiah to build a wall around Jerusalem. And I said, Mr. President, God is not against walls. Walls are not unchristian. The Bible says even heaven is going to have a wall around it. Not everyone's going to be allowed in. While Jeffress does not equate the United States to heaven, he might as well have that heaven has a wall around it and that it is used to exclude people from the city serves as the justification for America's wall. Jeffress simply invokes America as the new Jerusalem as pundits, politicians, and church leaders have throughout its history. But can concrete slabs or steel fencing along the U.S.-Mexico border resemble the bejeweled walls of the New Jerusalem? The language wall proponents, especially Trump, has used certainly echo several main themes of the description we find in Revelation chapter 21, which describes the city thus. It has the glory of God and the radiance like a very rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It has a great high wall with 12 gates, and the gates 12 angels, and on the gates are inscribed the names of the 12 tribes of the Israelites. The angel who talked to me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width, and he measured the city with his rod 1,500 miles, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall 144 cubits by human measurement, which the angel is using. The wall is built of jasper, while the city is pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the wall of the city are adorned with every jewel, and the 12 gates are 12 pearls. Each of the gates is a single pearl, and the street of the city is pure gold, transparent as glass. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. This description or revelation is one of the most detailed in the New Testament, but four major themes regarding the wall stand out. It is big, it is beautiful, it is clear, and it has gates. The measurements of the New Jerusalem are massive. 12,000 stadia by 12,000 stadia, or in US measurements, 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles, making the city larger than India and almost two thirds the size of the United States. Even more bizarre is that the angel measures the height of the city at 1,500 miles as well, indicating an otherworldly type of wall stretching towards space. Someone actually made this online as a mock-up to scale. The angel also measures the thickness of the wall, 144 cubits or roughly 216 feet thick. It is hard to imagine such a city wall, just as much of Revelation's descriptions confound imagination. But the bizarre measurements imply that a literal comprehension and visualization of the wall are not the point. More important and typical of apocalyptic are the focus on perfect numbers of Jewish numerology, all divisible by 12, 
and the overwhelming awesomeness created by such a description. Trump has described his wall in various ways through his campaign and presidency, but he consistently dwelled on just how big the wall would be, specifically on particular numbers. Over and over again, he claimed the wall would stretch to 1,000 miles during his campaign and into the first half of his presidency. He also stressed the number of feet high the wall would stand, sometimes 50 feet tall, sometimes 32 feet tall. It did not matter what it, that his name numbers changed or were both structurally and economically completely unrealistic. The measurements were symbolic as they are for the New Jerusalem. The numbers are giant and whole and repeated, drumming into the ears of the faithful so that they believe Trump's authority and ability to raise up or slam down this wall, sealing off America as the New Jerusalem. Beyond big and the numbers Trump would reel off in touting his wall, the other main descriptor he used to describe it was beautiful. Again and again, Trump referred to a big, beautiful wall and perhaps his vocabulary limited him or perhaps he enjoyed the alliteration and maybe he was just playing to his audience, but his emphasis on beautiful went beyond simply slapping a positive spin on an ugly dividing line. For one thing, he felt that anything that bore his name should be beautiful. I want it to be beautiful, he said, because someday, maybe they'll call it the Trump wall, maybe. So I have to make sure it's beautiful, right? Of course, Trump uh, may have somewhat an idiosyncratic idea of beauty, given that he once said barbed wire can be a beautiful sight. Nevertheless, this language of a beautiful wall made its way into the wider discourse, even affecting the language of the US Customs and Border Patrol when they commissioned eight companies to build prototypes for the border wall. We'll be looking at aesthetics, stated CBP Acting Deputy Commissioner Ronald, Ronald DiVitello, leading with the beauty of each prototype, and then adding how penetrable they are, how resistant they are to tampering, and then scaling or anti-climbing features. Once the eight prototypes had been revealed, a nonprofit organization named MAGA petitioned to preserve the prototypes as a national monument stating that they, quote, have significant cultural value and are historical land art. The organization announced the land art exhibition prototypes and offered guided tours of these structures. John of Patmos also receives a guided tour on which he beholds the gleaming and beautiful bejeweled walls of the New Jerusalem. As the city descends, the 12 foundations of its wall gleam with precious jewels significant to Israelite history and presenting opulence and power. And just as Trump imagined his name to be attached to his big, beautiful wall, there are names inscribed on the walls and its foundations, the 12 tribes written at each gate and the 12 apostles on each foundation, naming those by which the city and its populace have been established. The entire city glows with the glory of God who dwells within. And this radiance shines not just outward from the city, but through the city and its walls. Revelation 21, 11 reads, it has the glory of God and a radiance like a very rare jewel, like Jasper, clear as crystal. Jasper also forms the gigantic walls above foundations of jewels. So the reader can imagine the new Jerusalem, not just to be formidable, enormous and beautiful, but also luminously transparent with the brilliance of the divine shining through the entire edifice. Incredibly, this detail also figured prominently in Trump's description of the border wall. Trump, after receiving border patrol feedback regarding his giant concrete wall, added that his wall would not only be big and beautiful, but also see-through. He said, one of the things with the wall is you need transparency. You have to be able to see through it. So it could be a steel wall with openings, but you have to have openings because you have to see what's on the other side of the wall. When they throw the large sack of drugs over, and if you have people on the other side of the wall, you don't see them. They hit you on the head with 60 pounds of stuff. It's over. Again, he explained, they need see-through. We need a form of fence or window. And if you have a wall this thick and it's solid concrete from the ground to 32 feet high, which is a high wall, much higher than people planned, you go 32 feet up and you don't know who's over here. You don't know who's there. You've got a problem. Of course, Trump and the Border Patrol required a transparent or see-through wall, not to magnify the divine radiance of America, the shining city on a hill, but for purposes of surveillance. 
Trump made sure to characterize those hoping to climb the wall as drug lords or smugglers, somehow launching 60 pound bags of drugs over a purported 32 foot high barrier. These criminals, he argued, must be watched. These are the bad hombres he invoked to his listeners, not refugees, not families, and certainly not children. Light does, however, beam out from the United States at the border wall, the light of vigilantes and guards and the light of surveillance. In fact, lighting the wall began long before Trump's political career. In 1990, a California group calling themselves the Alliance for Border Patrol Control organized a monthly protest against Mexican immigrants and gathered hundreds of cars at the border to shine their headlights together into Mexico. When undocumented immigration at the border surged after the North American Free Trade Agreement, the Clinton administration set up stadium lights along the wall shining into Tijuana. And these are not the only lights shining at the border. Sensor lights, infrared, and backscatter lights also beam their rays, creating a barrier of watchfulness against intruders, like the 12 angels at the 12 gates of the New Jerusalem. This is not just fanciful and extended comparison. In 1986, the organization Civilian Material Assistance, a group including Vietnam veterans, Ku Klux Klan members, and ultra-conservative birchers, dispatched 20 vigilantes to the border, calling them border angels. The heavenly language of revelation creeps into every corner of immigration, borders, and walls. And it should be said that the language of immigration, borders, and walls creeps into every corner of revelation. That is to say, Reading the revelation of John through the lens of American immigration history reveals interpretations that surprise and subvert our expectations. Is the light of the New Jerusalem simply a glorious divine radiance illuminating a city for the sake of its citizens? Or is it also the light of surveillance? Why does the city have walls? Why does it not simply span the whole of existence freely? Why does it have an enclosure given with definite measurements, impossibly high and impossibly thick? Here one might object. Clearly, all who could be enemies of God's city, those who worship the beast, those who turned away from the lamb, and the beast, the devil, and death and Hades themselves had been thrown into the lake of fire in Revelation chapter 20. Surely the radiance, the strength, and the size of the city symbolize only divine awesomeness and not guarded defenses. So revelation, again, as is typical of apocalyptic, does not offer consistency or continuity. What do we find in Revelation chapter 22, 14 to 15? Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they will have the right of the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and fornicators and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. This verse comes at the end of Revelation after the descending of the heavenly city. Yet lurking outside the gates are dogs and sorcerers and fornicators and murderers, the bad hombres, the drug dealers, criminals and rapists envisioned by Trump and his allies. And yes, there are gates, 12 gates in the New Jerusalem, each of them made of a single enormous pearl. So though the city is encircled by an impossibly imposing wall, it is not hermetically sealed to the outside. In fact, these 12 gates remain open at all times. The verse says, its gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night there. Whether bathed in the glow of the divine or pierced by the surveilling searchlights of the almighty, the gates do not shut while there is light. And even Trump concedes that there must be a gate in his wall. In fact, he said that the wall would have a quote, very big, very beautiful door. Trump is of course, not the first or only to imagine America with these walls and gates. Ronald Reagan did so, albeit in far more eloquent terms in his farewell speech to the nation in January, 1989. He said, I've spoken of the shining city all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God blessed and teeming with people of all kinds, living in harmony and peace, a city with free ports that hummed with commerce and creativity. And if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. That's how I see it and how I see it still. 
Reagan plucks imagery directly from Revelation 21 down to the detail of city walls and open gates, which Reagan mentions in reluctant tones, regretting that things, such things must be. And here we find another commonality that links Revelation to Reagan, to Trump, and to many politicians describing America as the shining city on a hill. An emphasis not only on gates and open doors, but also of people actively entering the holy city. Who or what enters at the gates? Again, Revelation, Reagan and Trump, and the US government for as long as borders have been enforced in its history with Mexico project the same image. Trump stated in 2015, this will be a wall with a very big, very beautiful door because we want the legals to come back into the country. The type of legals Trump and his administration opened that beautiful door to, according to former ICE director Tom Homan, are those of quote, extraordinary talent, professional and specialized vocations, exceptional academic track records. Reagan, ever playing the benevolent host, softens the language to say that anyone with the will and the heart may enter America as the new Jerusalem. But what kind of populace do we see within the walls of his city? All kinds living in harmony and peace, yes, but with an emphasis on free ports that hum with commerce and creativity. Clearly the gates to America open for those outside, so long as they bring with them prosperity, privilege, and the promise of wealth. Revelation's gates stand open for the same reason. It admits those carrying in riches and tribute. Revelation 21, 24, and 26 read, the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. People will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. These are the only people described to be actively entering the city, those bringing wealth to enrich the new Jerusalem. Immediately following these verses, as is typical in American immigration discourse and not just apocalyptic, is the description of those who may not enter, but nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Like Revelation's New Jerusalem entry policy, American policy at the US-Mexico border and virtually every point of contact internationally revolves around wealth and commerce. Just as kings with tribute may enter freely at the walls of the New Jerusalem, so the barrier dissolves between the US and Mexico when it comes to those of the greatest wealth and power. What better analogy exists for the North American Free Trade Agreement and now its successor, the US-Mexico-Canada Agreement, which enables multinational corporations to cross borders at will and manufacture, drill, frack, and refine with impunity with regards to the environment, local laws, and each nation's workforce. In truth, the Trump wall and the fencing that was up long before it have never been effective or were even meant to be. Just as 1,500 miles high walls, 216 feet thick, serve no physical purpose in a truly post-apocalyptic, post-lake of fire landscape, the U.S.-Mexico border wall affects no real defense against drug cartels and human traffickers, but instead has harmed refugees and families along with migrating wildlife and the surrounding natural environment. The wall's utility lies in its symbolic power to rally votes and to fire up a cult of personality, to stir up racist fears based on a myth of scarcity in order to enforce other American policies of immigration, trade, and defense. America as the New Jerusalem does not need walls, let alone a single strip of climbable, penetrable, and eroding wall that will never be finished. America enforces borders everywhere without a single concrete slab or steel slat through its military, surveillance, and corporate interests in territories around the globe. The US has effectively set up borders all over in the interest of intelligence and finance so that as historian Grandin notes, the world looks more like a maze than a shared planet. The imagery and the vision driving the spread of this American empire of borders across the globe, perhaps more than the frontier myth, is the apocalyptic conceptualization of the nation as God's heavenly city justifying American exceptionalism and American right to power. In each stage of American expansion, from discovery to global markets, the new Jerusalem metaphor has morphed to inspire and justify it. Politicians throughout American history 
have used Revelation's discourse witting or unwittingly, because in the beginning, it's so well captured European imagination in the 15th and 16th centuries, and it has proved pliable and expedient in every age thereafter. The New Jerusalem metaphor's utility lies chiefly in its ability to be recycled, so that what once convinced colonists that indigenous genocide was clearing the land for their heavenly dwelling can be repurposed to forbid the yellow peril from entering as a swarm of locusts. The border wall and its conceptualization likewise recycle racist white supremacist hate and violence from throughout American history. And not only figuratively recycles, but literally, the first real barrier went up along the US-Mexico border in 1945 after World War II, made of chain link fencing recycled from the internment camps used to imprison Japanese Americans. Almost 50 years later, the Clinton administration in the wake of ratifying NAFTA put up 15 miles of wall using steel helicopter landing pads used during the Vietnam War. They were so sharp that migrants trying to climb over often suffered their fingers. The term apocalypse rarely evokes visions of comfort in popular culture. And even within faith communities and scholarly guilds, apocalyptic literature can mean embarrassment, confusion, or simply a bizarre ancient curiosity. And still many have and do derive comfort from the promises offered within the New Jerusalem walls, where death is no more, where every tear is wiped away, where one can find healing and eternal life in the light of God. But in the vision of the seer, Heaven is not a habitation that stretches out to eternity, borderless and infinite. And heaven's demarcation is troubling. Its lines, powerful, authoritative, numerically determined, drawn around the entire city, divides those from inside and outside and divides them absolutely. Writer Ayesha Siddiqui wrote, every border implies the violence of its maintenance. If this is so, how can the final vision of Revelation ever be free from violent exclusion? How can the United States ever cease violent maintenance of its borders? Can it ever divorce itself from the myth of the new Jerusalem? Are there ways to imagine nationalism in a way outside of lines? Can we live without lines? When considering the architect Constant Neuweheis believed that every line is violent, even the lines forming our own individual houses. I tentatively propose here a type of anti-New Jerusalem conception that rejects the finality of lines and walls so lavishly detailed in Revelation. It is, in a sense, an interpretation and theology that works against any ultimate conception, an ultimate ending, an ultimate destruction, an ultimate abode with ultimate boundaries. I would like to turn our attention to another book of the New Testament, although it is also to work against its probable purpose. The book is the epistle to the Hebrews, a complicated text loaded with analogies and metaphors. I wish to focus on one concept found in chapter eight, five and chapter nine, verse 23, both using the Greek term hupadegma. In both verses, there appears this word hupadegma, meaning a copy or a sketch or a pattern of heavenly things. And the reader is to understand that this copy or sketch is inferior. Hebrews 8, 5 reads, earthly priests offer worship in a sanctuary that is a sketch and a shadow of the heavenly one. For Moses, when he was about to erect the tent, was warned, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. And again, the concept is used in Hebrews 9, 23. It was necessary for the sketches of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. I suggest plucking out this shadowy sketch of heaven from the context of Hebrews to think about them in a way completely counter to the letter's direction. That is to think of the sketch and the shadow of the heavenly things, not as inferior, but in fact, far superior and more merciful and compassionate than the heaven reality of Hebrews and Revelation and the Platonic ideal. When an artist sketches, it is not in bold, definite lines, but with tentative, repeated, unconnected strokes. Permanent deep lines destroy the beauty and purpose of the sketch, which allows an artist to create possibilities for the future rather than close them off. Sketches and copies run counter to finality, to authority and exclusivity. Similarly, shadows are immaterial and cast by light. They're also transient and shifting. They may sharpen or soften depending on the light. The shadow of heaven 
if it is not cast by the harsh light of surveillance, but by the compassionate glow of the divine is soft around the edges. Heaven remains vague, but present without a final forbidding form. If America must understand itself in apocalyptic heavenly terms, and perhaps this is inevitable, can it do so by reconceptualizing itself as a sketch or a shadow of heaven, both living in the hope of a refuge, but without the lines of borders and walls? I look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Lin, really fascinating. Um, we have a question. Obviously you have been, um, we've been focused on America, but uh, we have a question in terms of, are there other countries that have a tendency to associate themselves with the new Jerusalem as well, or is that unique to the United States? I think, I mean, depends on how far back in time you would like to go. And, you know, for speaking of nationalism, there's a specific, you know, modern type of understanding of nation, but I think certainly empire um, from the writing of Revelation has claimed that role and there, it has morphed in various ways. I think though in our modern era, America is uniquely identified as such because it came at such a, I mean, I, I'd say serendipitous, although I'm not sure we can say it in such positive terms, but the, the quote unquote discovery of America came at a, um, a moment of apocalyptic fervor in Europe that just made its appearance on the scene just so catastrophic, astounding, impossible, amazing. Um, I think it's been assigned that identity ever since in both um, those who came over and those who are writing of it in the old world, right? So we, we are constantly thinking of the new world in this particular way. So that's how I would, I would answer it. Unique in this modern sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's, there's something that, that I've been thinking about and wanna get your take on this. I've been thinking about uh, the inscription on the Statue of Liberty, right? Mm -hmm. um, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, which kind of harkens to Matthew 11, and come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest, right? So is your feeling in your research that America never really did lean into that vision of America being as a place where all could come, but actually really looked at itself more as described in Revelation as the New Jerusalem, where the people we really want here are the people who are gonna to contribute to, to our economy and, and our, our growth and industrialization, right? Yeah. So I, I would say there is, there is the uh, America and the reality that people um, encounter when they immigrate to the United States. And often, sometimes, I mean, it is, it is offering a better life. It is operate, offering opportunity and safety and all of those things. Um, so I don't want to say that it's never right, been a, a, a place that has promise for those who are coming to its shores. At the same time, I would say that American uh, government policy regarding immigration has not been so. So the reality of what's happening and what people experience, even if they have these positive experiences and, and um, you know, find lots of possibility and stay and flourish, that's not mostly thanks to the United States immigration policy. So what has driven immigration policy, if you look, it's very clear is the maintenance of, of a certain type of population. Um, there are quotas that are given and there have been moments of change, I would say, especially in 1965, when we had an overhaul of immigration laws that opened um, immigration to many more, including much of Asia. A lot of that though is also credited to wanting to, to uh, have um, right successful, educated people come and there's definite brain drain, as they call it, of certain countries as they come here. Um, but there, there have been positive moments in immigration reform, um, but there's one single consistency, which is to drive a particular population. And I would say specifically around race. Um, I think the one question you would ask is what identity is never questioned in Im immigration policy in the United States? Um, and that would be the immigration of those who are um, not just white, um, uh, and not just, uh, but also Protestant, um, that would be included as well. So that, that's moved as people become white, become understood as white, become understood as acceptable or assimilable 
So I would say Italian, Irish, et cetera, moved gradually through the 19th century into those categories. Um, but there's one single constant that hasn't changed, it hasn't been questioned. Um, and I would say we need to look at that and see what that means. Yeah, yeah. How does your perspective of revelation in the New Jerusalem inform the uh, communitarian versus cosmopolitan debate within political philosophy? Would you say your interpretation of the New Jerusalem leans more towards one than the other? I need more description of that. I'm not a political philosopher. Okay. Daniel, would you like to unmute and add a little to that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, <clears throat> the, the communitarian versus um, cosmopolitan framework, uh, communitarian often uh, speaks more towards a, a nation state uh, being, um, being able to de determine itself. It's more of a closed uh, borders uh, perspective, whereas a cosmopolitan perspective has more of an open borders uh, perspective, uh, more universal citizenship than limited uh, citizenship. So, um, yeah, I'm just wondering uh, if if the, the the description in which you described the New Jerusalem within Revelation would lead more and towards more of a more uh, cosmopolitan uh, perspective of open borders, um, universal citizenship versus uh, the, the the latter. Well, I would say that <laughs> Revelation, I mean, at least the, the scenario that we're seeing at the end of it um, is unique in that it is understanding itself as post-history, right? Post-nationhood, post. -nationhood, post um, so there is one nation, right? It, it would be both and, right? In which we have um, only the community within and only um, and shut off. But the same time, that is as far as we know, besides, I don't know, the stragglers outside, I'm not sure what's happening in Revelation 22. Um, but that is all there is, right? So it's just, it's just very strange, like expanding and contracting that's going on at the same time where you don't have a dichotomy. You have both because of the unique uh, vantage point of apocalyptic um, in it's imagining in which the kingdom of God is now everything, right? It covers everything. There is a, the sense of diversity in that we have um, people of all kinds and all nations, all tongues, et cetera, inside. Um, but then it is under, it is in one city. Um, so how do you think about that would be really interesting um, to think of a both and scenario um, post, post heaven and earth, right? That we know today. Hmm. Right. You had mentioned that the first section of physical wall built in the United States was in 1945, right? After, after World War II, was there a particular um, concern or a uh, particular movement that caused that section of wall to be built at that time? Well, there has been a growing sense, uh, especially after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, when we had uh, the American empire had taken lands to become part of Mexico and suddenly, or to become part of the United States. Um, and suddenly we had people who didn't know where they belong. So the understanding of citizenship, um, especially those who are native to Mexican, uh, land suddenly found themselves in the United States, right? So then there was that question brewing this entire time. And there were those who had elected to then become United States citizens, but they weren't granted the full benefits of that in terms of voting and operating as free and white citizens in the US. Um, and as that happened, there was the growing um, migration to work in the United States as cheap labor. And so there was a clamor for something to be done um, early in the 20th century um, through 1923, where there's some uh, quotas put down by the federal government. Um, and people thought you had not done enough to limit Mexican migration in the United States. Um, and so I think it was a long time coming when that finally came in 1945. Um, yeah. Right. Do we have any other questions for Professor Lin this morning? All right. If not, um, Professor Lin, thank you so much. Um, very interesting and informative and really looking forward to, to your book. And thank you, everyone, for being with us this morning. And uh, we hope you, you'll join us again soon. In the meantime, uh, everyone stay safe and well and enjoy your weekend.